Well, uh, we were talking in the green room and we've decided we're delighted to be the last panel because uh, it pulls together so many of the, the themes of the day um, uh, in this discussion on short-termism in government. Many of you will be familiar with the, uh, the metaphor of the civil service as a sort of a Rolls-Royce um, engine. I'd like you to think of this panel as more of a Lamborghini <laughs> type operation. Uh, you know, fast-paced, large intellectual engine, <laughs> and I think I'm going to struggle to steer, um, knowing these three colleagues here to my left. And some of the themes of the day around short-termism has come up in, in session one already. We've heard a lot about data, 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 data. There is this sort of perception sometimes in public policy that if only we had more data, if we could just fill this hole a little bit higher, we would then get good policy making. And I think part of the discussion that's come out across the three panels today is that data is necessary but not sufficient. So I often say to, to my students, um, the reason we haven't solved climate change is not because we don't yet know enough about it, I'm pretty sure it's happening. Let me put that out there. <laughs> There's a provocative, provocative start to a session. Um, but uh, the other aspects to policy making are what hold us back often. Uh, and a big part of that is whether governments have got enough uh, of a long-term vision or whether they're caught in the weeds of um, short-term decision making, which is what we're going to unpack this afternoon. Um, and to help me unpack it, um, we've got an, a wonderful panel um, who I'll introduce as we go along. And I'll start by asking each of them one question to sort of get us going, and then we'll um, kick around from there. So I'm going to uh, start the questioning with Dr. Kath Haddon at the end uh, of, of the panel um, from the Institute for Government. Uh, Kath does a lot of work with um, civil servants, with MPs, um, past, present and potentially future. <laughs> um, and my question to you, Kath, to sort of frame this for us is, how new is this problem of short-termism in government? Everybody you run into says, oh, God, government's just thinking short-term, short-term. Um, has that always been the case? Uh, we, we talked in the green room about whether or not to be controversial or not. I'm not going to go too far, but I'm always intrinsically opposed to the, anything that leads you into rose-tinted glasses when it comes to the past. You can easily point to examples of long-term policy-making uh, in past governments. I did my PhD with Peter Hennessy, and he's obsessed with Macmillan's future policy studies of uh, the 1959-1960 period that looked forward to the, to the 1970s. And this was the result of eight months of work by military planners and senior civil servants, but partly a reaction to the post-Suez crisis that uh, his government found himself in. Also, to some extent, a, a reflection of Macmillan's particular strategic way of uh, thinking about policy. But, I mean, the caveats to that, I, my PhD was on Cold War uh, nuclear weapons policy in the UK, and the entire theme of the period I looked at, 1945 to 1970, was, yes, you have these incredibly uh, long-term, in the military, national security world, that's where they love to, to look long-term. Uh, so these incredibly long, long studies. And yet, uh, you know, the entire history of our, our nuclear weapons policy is, is marked by moments when it was a reaction to what the Americans were doing, what the French were doing, sometimes to what the adversary, the, the USSR, was doing, and a lot of the times just a reaction to where the money was. Um, and so you, you can look at plenty of past governments where they were dealing with short-term crises. One only has to look at Suez, as I say, the IMF crisis, the economic crises of the 1970s. And the other thing that I'd say is, I mean, we're talking about short- and long-term policymaking. But one shouldn't assume that sort of longer-term thinking leads to better policies. 
uh, arguably the, the poll tax had a, a long genesis. Margaret Thatcher had been preoccupied by it since 1974. Uh, it was a long-standing problem of local authority funding, so it had a long genesis, uh, but a very short life. And some of the long-term problems that we uh, faced as a country don't need long-term policy planning just to circumvent particular political problems. So the House of Lords being a very good example of that. We've got, uh, you know, 100 years plus. Uh, the Blair government obviously did su significant change, but the size, the ideal role and the democratic deficit of the second chamber continues to be a problem. And uh, the Bennett Institute's uh, and Institute for Government's Constitution Review, as well as Philip Rycroft's excellent piece, um, I'll leave him to talk about that, did a, a very good paper from Meg Russell talking about how there's some just very good short-term fixes that, that governments could do if just the, the political will was there. Um, but that said, I think we do need to think about the sort of the present day of three particular factors. One is the tech drivers that are going on. There's, you know, you look at the history of government in the last 20, 30 years, people talk about 24-hour news, now social media, these drivers, pressures on government in particular, the pull factors. But there's other considerations as well. Email, um, co-production tools. Uh, we know Dominic Raab is apparently, according to the Sunday Times, obsessed with track changes. Uh, messenger apps, WhatsApp by government is something the Institute's looked at a lot. These have all enabled speed of working across government. Now, this is a good thing and, you know, as well as potentially problematic. Um, if you look at government, it's great that it is able to work uh, quicker at times. And so a second factor, looking at policy drivers, we can see recently with the pandemic, with Brexit, government has had to be working more rapidly. It has had to innovate, uh, develop ways. You know, a, a massive increase in the use of real-term data, uh, the ability to make decisions very quickly. And this has had a, a bit of a change when it comes to the civil service. You now see uh, an emphasis, we saw it in the, in the pandemic, of people getting legislation up by midnight. Um, you have a, a generation of civil servants who have become used to policy making as a sort of crisis solution finding process. And that, in many respects, is a good thing. As I say, it leads to innovation. But it does also put pressure on this idea that you can't take time. You've got to find rapid uh, solutions. So that's, that's a big one. The final factor that I'd like to talk about in terms of recent years, though, is uh, political drivers. Um, I know we talk about it a lot, about the sort of uh, hyper-politicisation, the sort of hyperactivity of government recently, but um, it is an incredible amount of churn that we have seen in the last uh, decade or so, um, if you include the coalition government, which, you know, to some extent looks like a steady estate uh, government <coughs> compared to more recent years, and yet at the same time was two political parties working together, so had its own sort of uh, pulls and pushes. But since 2016, uh, how many prime ministers we've had? You know, three prime ministers last year, four chancellors last year. This kind of churn in our political system undoubtedly makes a difference. One of the obsessions that the IFG has is over ministerial churn and the, the impact that that has on policymaking because we interview former ministers. We've interviewed nearly 150 of them. And... Um, they talk to us about how many months it takes to get up and running. We talk to civil servants about planning for a reshuffle. And there's always a load of decisions that have to be put on pause whilst you're waiting for new people to come in. And that just means that you're then in a hurry. So I think there is a problem. Um, we've, it's definitely been a theme of the day. But I think in, when we're looking at some of the factors, some of those things are good things uh, when we're talking about innovation, when we're talking about rapidity of, of responses and so forth. So we have to find the right balance between when can we get that, that kind of enthusiasm and energy uh, towards good policy making and when is it actually preventing us from taking the time to find meaningful solutions to the big issues of the day, whether it's climate change, reaching net zero, or whether it's an aging population or, or whatever. The studies are there, as we've been talking about all day, the evidence is all there. So it's difficult to know sort of how to find the solutions. Hopefully, in the next hour and a half, we'll do so. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I hope so, too. Um, <laughs> so short-termism, not new, but some of the pressures of the current environment are. 
um, which seems like a nice point to move to you, Philip. So uh, Philip Rycroft, for the very, very few of you in the room who won't know, uh, was a former permanent secretary, um, most uh, recently or excitingly at the Department for Exiting the European Union. Um, and we can have a discussion over whether that was a good piece of long-term uh, <laughs> policy making or not, and we, we may get to that in question mm -hmm. time. Um, but my question for you, Philip, I suppose, from the, a civil service point of view, is that two of the, the core functions of the civil service are to hold institutional memory, so to somehow provide some continuity, you know, to buttress against short-termism, and to speak truth to power, and provide sort of frank and fearless advice. Is, have those two sort of functions been diminished by the short-termism that we see? Um, thanks, Dennis. I, I wouldn't quite define the problem like that. I think there is a lot of very good, capable, long-term thinking done in the civil service. Obviously, not all of that surface is in the public domain, but you've got one end of the spectrum, you've got formal programs like Foresight, which are very sort of academically driven, uh, uh, led out of the office of the government, uh, 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 the, the, sci the, the government scientist office. Um, you've had a scatter of policy units; they sort of come and go a wee bit. But real quality thinking done at central government. Every department has its own sort of strat strategy teams. The capability to absorb the evidence, to understand the evidence, the data. That's all there. And indeed, it translates into long-term decisions. The governments are capable of making long-term decisions. Um, let, let me just give you two examples just to sort of give a sort of a concrete feel for what a long-term decision look, looks like. We're building a very big nuclear power station down at Inkley. And that is a decision, you know, that big lump of concrete will sit there for a very long time. The waste it produces will sit there for, you know, for thousands of years. HS2 is a very long-term decision. You're changing the infrastructure of the country in quite a profound way. There's many, many other examples, net zero targets and so on. So the government can take, governments can take long-term decisions. The problem then is not so much either articulating the long-term problem, providing evidence for that, um, or taking the decision that is meant to be long-term, it's sticking with the long-term decision is the problem, as I see. We, we picked, this was picked up almost by the first thing that was said this morning. It's so the chopping and changing in the policy environment. So let me take that Hinkley example. Who is building it? It's EDF. It's not a British concern. Why? Because British energy and nuclear policy has chopped and changed so much over the decades that there hasn't been that, that moment, there hasn't been that time to build up the capability within the UK, it's gone to a French concern. You look at the French decision-making on their nuclear industry, that uh, has been a lot more consistent over time. You look at HS2, uh, which is my current favorite example, this absurd spectacle at the moment, this thing might stop five miles short of its destination. <laughs> so us benighted northerners hop on the train somewhere up in the chilly north, and we get down close to where we think we're going, and this guy says, you'll have you had your chips, lads, now up it. And you're off the train, you trudge five miles into London to where you need to get to. It is quite extraordinary. But if you look at the way that that policy has been managed, it's like the, 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 the HS2 pig is constantly being weighed. Every time you do that, you add cost, you add, uh, and you, you diminish the value of the project because people lose faith in it. And so I've made my point. Uh, the, the other example I just wanted to pick out, because I, I think just to give recognition to the paper that uh, Mike and Jack Newman have just published on uh, the devolution within England. When the Labour Party set up the RDAs, they would have anticipated the RDAs being there as a long-term capability for the regions of England. Um, but they survived, what was it, seven or eight years, replaced by the local enterprise partnerships. What's happened to local enterprise partnerships? I think this week just announced that that that's curtains for them as well. It's that chopping and changing of decision-making over time. So why is it uh, that we're, we find ourselves with that sort of decision-making now? <coughs> I have to say the civil service is part of the problem. You talk about institutional memory. Institutional memory in the civil service is not good. And the reason for that, very straightforward, is that you have this immense churn of civil servants. Anybody who tries to deal with a civil service from outside, the folk you get to know and understand, they understand your issues, you deal with them for a couple of years and they're off. 
Um, and there is no way within the civil service of working out who knows what about anything. So you've got a new policy problem. You can't just get to a database. So who's worked on this sort of thing before? So there's a constant reinvention yeah. uh, by the civil servants. But that goes a lot deeper than that, if you'll just indulge me three or four other quick points on this. Um, uh, because that, of course, nests within a wider political governance model. And one thing that we, it seems to me, does bedevil all of this is, and I'm going to use shorthand here, but the, the treasury mindset. The focus on managing cash, essentially, rather than long-term investment value. And, the, and the, the grip of that psychology uh, on government goes very, very deep. And you look at the way the Labour Party now is struggling to formulate a programme for government that stays within those constraints. This is, I think, an illustration um, uh, of that. Um, my next point, to remind myself, uh, centralisation of decision-making. Whitehall's simply doing too much, and that's been a bit of a theme today. Um, uh, the, the decision making isn't handed out uh, to where it should lie with those who are closer to the communities uh, it affects. A point that Kath picked up, the sort of ministerial lifespan, uh, the average, I don't know what the average is, it's maybe a couple of years, two, three years, and you get to this high office estate, you, you know, everybody's dead chuffed with you, your family's quite proud of you, and you want to leave a mark, and if you're sensible, you know you might only be there for a couple of years, and you don't leave a mark by saying, you know, the person who came before me had this brilliant policy, I'm just going to continue it. Um, so the itch to have new policy, and how many times have you read, every day of the week, you and so has announced a new policy, you can't quite understand what the policy is about, but there's a pound sign, we're going to spend £50 million on this, oh, great, without actually explaining how that's going to make any difference. Uh, to the outcomes of people in the, the day. So the, the nature of the way that political process works. But to, to take just to one sort of final point on this, you know, that the, the, the broader nature of our political process, and this is perhaps a little bit controversial, is the way that our system generates, if you like, that partisan opposition and does not encourage cross-party consensus building to sustain policies over time. Uh, my own view is the, uh, our first-past-the-post system has quite a lot to answer for this. Um, uh, and I think we need to think about the way we elect politicians, the incentives they've got um, uh, to answer the problem about the, the <coughs> framing of, of governance in this problem. It's a big answer to a big question and probably won't get there anytime soon. But I think we have to think about what it is that drives that tendency towards partisanship. Mm. So it's not... I mean, we've all talked to politicians, we've worked closely with politicians. Politicians aren't just daft. It's not that they're not getting it, that they're not seeing what the rest of us can see, but there are structural incentives at play here that are influencing the decisions that are made. Um, the the centralisation point in Whitehall uh, interests me and is a nice segue to um, a question now to you, Halima. So um, Halima uh, has worked at all levels of government, um, most recently with the Greater London Authority, but also in central government, has worked with Nesta from the outside. And so my question to you, Halima, is whether there is a level of government which does termism better, that doesn't feel so, you know, convoluted, short-term short decision making, fast decision making. Thank you. So um, what I thought I'd do is start with a couple of examples and then, and then some reflections on that. So um, an example from national government. So I worked at the Prime Minister's strategy unit, as was back in the early um, 2000s, which was actually the model that then has spread across Whitehall into individual departmental strategy units since then. It was set up by Tony Blair as a sort of think tank within government um, and explicitly aimed at longer term thinking. Um, when I joined the strategy unit, our time horizons were roughly 10 to 15 years for, for, for the, each project. 
things changed, and over, over the period of time that I was there, by the time I left the strategy unit, our, our time horizons were roughly 10 to 15 hours. Um, so we would come in in the morning and say, and somebody would say, can you get me an answer on this? X, social care, transport, something else, by this afternoon. It was literally like that. And lots of things were going on over that period of time um, to explain that quite dramatic shift in time horizon. I think uh, one of the major factors, though, was that, as I understand it, some of these longer-term pieces of work landed with other ministers. So this was obviously the strategy unit was very aligned with number 10, they, they landed with other ministers at points that were sort of at best inconvenient in terms of the political cycle or, or sort of disconnected from their political needs at that, at that time. Um, what then happened was we didn't find a middle ground. We just sort of reverted back to the daily news cycle. So we, we didn't find anything in between. But that's, the sort, of, that's sort of the, the first example. The second, then, um, is sort of down at local government. So I spent time in Camden Council in, in North London. And all local authorities have a, a statutory duty for, to develop five-year plans. Now, you know, we could argue that five years is not you know, medium term. Maybe it's not very long term, but it's certainly longer than a year. Um, and the, 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 this plan that we were developing at the time, we used very... Um, participatory models to develop it. So we held lots of neighbourhood meetings across the borough. Um, so councillors, elected councillors, were sitting next to their constituents, their citizens in their local patch, together debating the future of Camden as a borough with this kind of five-year time horizon. What then happened was that an election fell um, towards the end of the development process of this five-year plan, sort of roughly three-quarters of the way through. And, so, and it was actually um, a shock defeat for the Labour administration that was, had previously been running Camden for actually quite a few terms. It was quite a sort of well-embedded Labour administration who weren't expecting to lose that election. So we were then as officers dealing with a new uh, set of politicians who actually um, were a Conservative Lib Dem coalition, one that sort of predated the then equivalent national swing kind of about three years later. Um, what was interesting, though, was because those same elected politicians had been involved themselves in these participatory processes that we used to develop the five-year plan, and because they'd seen the extent to which we had engaged with citizens all across the borough, they were actually very happy to continue with that five-year plan with some adjustments to their political programme. But they didn't scrap it. They actually continued with it. And I think that's interesting. I think it's you know, reasonably significant that it was <coughs> that sense of kind of cross-party buy-in combined with kind of direct participation by citizens that kind of allowed it to go through. So those are the two examples. So some quick sort of reflections off that. So, I mean, very much echoing others. So all of this sort of happens within our electoral system. You know, that's the, that's the, uh, you know, the political environment in which we're all operating as policymakers is determined to a large extent by that. And our electoral system is a sort of majoritarian and you could argue sort of somewhat adversarial, particularly at the, at the national level, and that does set the tone. Um, and assuming that we're nowhere near sort of any electoral reform changes, I think then in terms of how do you inculcate a sense of long-termism in that kind of political environment. I think you have to look for things that can kind of mitigate against that very kind of short-term sort of cycle that politicians are, are subject to. So three quick ways, I think, that, of doing that, and this relates to sort of other tiers of government, because I think they are easier at the regional um, and local level, and also um, at, the, at the level of sort of devolved nations as well. Um, so the first is the political nature of, of long-termism. So I think where the, the Prime Minister's strategy unit went um, slightly sort of, you know, off course in a way um, was to sort of treat long-termism as a sort of technocratic exercise that, that became too disconnected from politics. And um, I think, you know, in order to create a sort of momentum for long-termism, I think we need to find a way, as you said, of, of creating more kind of cross-party discussions about things. And that, that is easier at the regional and local, um, local level and, to some extent, the, the, the devolved nations. So that's the first. The second, then, uh, mitigating factor is a connection to place. And we've, we've heard this, actually, throughout, throughout the day. And I think a connection to place grounds 
policymakers and politicians more firmly in the, in the longer term. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So when I worked at London City Hall for the, for the Mayor of London, um, you know, that mayor, the Mayor of London, like, like other mayors across the country, has a very powerful democratic mandate from the place that they represent. So the mayor is waking up every day thinking, how can I represent London and Londoners? And that immediately kind of lifts the site to and has that very strong connection to London and Londoners, which is then mirrored by the officers. So all of the officers working in London City Hall, I think, have an incredibly strong connection to London and Londoners, which again, I think, grounds things in that kind of longer term um, kind of perspective. And I think we've heard this sort of through other discussions, but I think alongside that, I think you can get into sort of some very kind of positive cycles at the regional and local level where you have, you know, local data sets we've been talking about, local evidence, combined with a little bit more institutional memory. People kind of stick around for longer. People have been working in Greater Manchester for, for long periods of time. Um, people get to know one another on a patch. All of those things, I think, kind of mitigate sort of towards long-termism. And then the third and final is um, that, that connection to people. That's another kind of mitigation. And so I, I use the example of that, those kind of participatory methods we used in Camden. I think that's another kind of grounding where both, again, sort of thinking about citizens and what, what's good for citizens is a way of kind of slightly rebalancing away from some of the short-termism. Mm -hmm. So those would be sort of thoughts from the kind of regional and, and local tier. Excellent. Some solutions for us to start thinking about. Um, um, uh, there's sort of an implicit thing underlying the conversation, which is that long-term equals good. Can we... How do I know? How do I know that long-term... So, Philip, how do I know that HS2 is a good piece of long-term decision-making or a bad piece of long-term decision... Or, or, or something else? I, that's a very good question. I was talking to Vicky Price earlier on who thinks it's a terrible long-term decision and <laughs> ought to be scrapped immediately. Sorry, Vicky, I don't know whether that's a problem. <laughs> but he, um, and it's a very good question. How do you know? Um, and, of course, it, Adam Price's question earlier on, how do you, how do you take a punt onto a future uh, where you don't have all the data? You can do all the cost-benefit analysis you like, but you'll never get an answer that says... And there's, there's quite a lot of examples of transport projects that have been on the verge of, of like not actually showing positive, but once introduced, sort of out, out, um, outperform expectations. And it's why we live in a democracy, ultimately, that politicians, uh, it is part of their job to look beyond the data, to look into the future, and take some of those punts. Um, and HS2, I think he's of that nature. Uh, I think it was missold at the start because it was all about, initially it was about speed, actually it's way more about capacity. It is the first really major piece of rail infrastructure that we've built since the Victorian times. And there is a sort of symbolism to these things. So it is very much in that sort of, okay, we are going to take this decision. But my point is that having taken the decision, stick with it. Because mm -hmm. if you don't stick with it, uh, the benefits that might accrue will, as we're seeing with HS2, evaporate slowly over time. And the thing becomes an embarrassment. Um, but the, for any long-term project, you can't... Any, any government policy, of course you need check, checkpoints and balance points. Take another example, which is a long-term policy, one that actually probably wouldn't have been sustained in quite the way it was without the political consensus that came with the coalition, which is the switch to universal credit. Um, is that working or not? You need those review points mm. to adjust course as you're moving on. But it's the... See, there, there is a careful balance here between reviewing, reassessing, seeing whether you've got the intended outcomes or perverse outcomes, um, but sticking with the objective not for political reasons, doing to say, well, that was the other lot's policy, so we're going to have another one. Uh, and you, the, the point being that so much of pub public policy is about building capacity. Capacity, ultimately, infrastructure is sort of physical capacity, but people capacity. You think about social care, education policy. Um, it is about building the capability of those running these systems to deliver good services to citizens, and every time you change policy, make them turn in a different direction, you're eroding that capacity because they've got to shift focus and go on to something else. So 
that sticking with it, I think, is so important, but with the checkpoints mm. en route. Kath, you want to come yeah, in? Yeah, I mean, Philip had just started to get on to the points I wanted to make. It's partly about how we conceive of policy. And, and you made the point about, for ministers, we definitely see this. One of the questions we always ask uh, former ministers when we do the, the exit interviews is, what are you most proud of in government? And it's almost in, inevitably something that, they can, that has a badge to it. It might be a piece of legislation or... Um, some kind of outcome. A lot of them do actually acknowledge it was starting something off that came to fruition after the, they left, um, left that particular job or left government. Um, and in other cases, it was finishing something off. So there is an, un, an understanding that they inherit a portfolio mm. or start a portfolio off and that you know, others might, might take the credit for that. But there is still something about the way in which the stuff gets gets badged, and obviously it's HS2, but really it's infrastructure policy. Um, and I think it was a theme that came out of the first two sessions in particular, is you've got to get this balance right between sufficient investment and continuity that those who are interdependent on governments can actually plan ahead, grow, and so forth. But you've also got to be able to iterate. And, and one of the things that we are terrible about is, is both accepting failure in government, uh, when things go wrong, learning from it and so forth, which is a natural part of, of any other business. Um, but also the idea of iteration, it has now become synonymous with the idea of the U-turn. Mm. And yes, in some of those cases, they are spectacular, colossal, and should be termed U-turns. But in other cases, it is about iterating, and it is about government learning, and it is about government being able to say hang on, you know, we, we got that um, not quite right. The other point that I'd like to make is, is a, another theme that's been coming up today is that there's actually quite a lot of consensus between the political parties mm. on, on some of the big issues of the day. They're both talking about levelling up. They both want to spend money on infrastructure if there was any money. Um, but part of the problem is that they're looking, therefore, for ways to differentiate themselves in the eyes of the public. And it goes back to this point I was making about the sort of the political turmoil of, of the last few years, we are now approaching, well, we're re already well into uh, an election campaign, frankly, um, that's going to dominate the next year. So you're, not, you're going to see a lot of long-term policy promises, but you know, whether or not you're going to see that progress or that sustainable foundation being built, because the incentive is there to rebadge it as something new that you've done that's different from the previous one. And that is as much true of ministers within the same party taking over from each other when they're you know, different wings of the party or they just hate the other person and they want to sort of differentiate. And that sounds, you know, as if I'm, I'm critiquing um, politicians alone. The same is true of, of civil servants wanting, you know, the, the churn of civil servants is they want to make their mark. They want to come in and work on a difficult policy problem, but they also want to move on to the next one because at the moment that's what the system really rewards. Mm. Um, and so we, we've got to think about those cultural incentives, both from the point of view of politicians and also from the point of view of, of civil servants. And I think we've got to be a bit sympathetic about why those factors are there. And it isn't just, you know, the politicians or the civil servants. It's about the interaction between that, the media, the think tanks, the whole ecosystem is, is breeding this kind of mentality. Mm. And, I mean, there's a democratic deficit argument to be made here, so I'll make it, um, that... Actually, it's potentially a good thing, isn't it, if government is responding to um, circumstances to push back um, from the electorate. This is where I'm interested, Liam, in your um, perspective on participative policy making as potentially, you know, acting as a, uh, buttressing us against the the worst effects of short termism, um, because if we're going to hold to long-term policy making. If we're saying we are building HS2, come what may, and we have five million people lined up from, from here to Birmingham protesting against it, the government says, I'm sorry, we've made a commitment to this. This is long-term policy making. Is there a way that we can... I mean, how can we prevent that sense of government knows better we don't have to react to what the electorate tells us to do. So perhaps, Salim, if you start on that. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think one, one response to that is looking at ways in which... Because I mean, absolutely, government needs to respond. I mean, you know, and COVID was a big shock, and there are other shocks we've, we've been talking about today. And, you know, of course. 
There are ways, I think, sometimes that governments can respond to those immediate short-term events in ways that are also consistent with long-term goals. So I'll give one example. It's a small example, but it, I think it, it nevertheless should um, hopefully help. So again, this is back, back to sort of London. I was there over the COVID pandemic. We had reached roughly about 75% of people getting their COVID vaccine across London, but were quite rightly under an enormous amount of pressure from national government to get that much, you know, much higher. We needed to get into the, the 80s and 90% of reach. And we, we knew at that point, so that, that, that's a very short term, that was a kind of, how can we, you know, how far can we get by next Monday? Um, we, we knew that, that, that we'd reached that sort of 75% through sort of tweaking existing sort of channels of getting vaccines to people. So, you know, clinics had been open longer hours, you know, so, you know, but we knew that this kind of last segment of population would require a different approach. Um, they were vaccine hesitant. There were reasons why they either didn't want to or couldn't kind of attend in those kind of clinical settings and so on. So where I think where we did well, I think, was then apply a much more sort of longer standing commitment to um, community development approaches to health and public health and apply to those in a kind of emergency condition. So what we then did was we mobilised a whole set of kind of community health workers, many of which had been sort of in and around the capital, but we also increased the numbers, used those kind of community development approaches to have conversations with those people who were in those sort of vaccine hesitant groups and managed to get our, um, our kind of vaccine levels higher. And I think, so that, that's an example where that, that was really sit, sort of regional government with the public health system deploying longer standing existing techniques um, in a short term way, which, you know, I think probably would have had longer term, multi, sort of longer term benefits in terms of kind of community building, possibly even trust in government, all kinds mm -hmm. of things. So that, that's, I think, one, one, mm -hmm. one response, which isn't mm -hmm. always possible, but I think we should look for opportunities to, to, to work in that way. Mm. And I think that's helpful because, in a way, if we've been identifying the problem as partly about, about churn of civil servants, it's about um, political incentives, there isn't really a world in which we turn those things off, in which we tell civil servants, you've got to stay in post for five years, you can't move. Um, cabinet, you know, cabinet appointees get five years, come what may. Um, so do we have to structure our responses in ways that deal with the world as it is? Is that, is that where we are, Philip? Well, I, I think there, there are things you can do about that. So um, actually in the coalition time, uh, where I worked in Deputy Prime Minister's office, there was stability in senior ministerial appointments and uh, ministers tenure is partly a factor of coalition because it's harder to move the pieces around the chessboard. Um, so you've got, uh, this is a sort of little um, advertorial for coalitions actually, you've got, you've got folk in post longer, more consistent policy making but you also had an internal check and balance on policy making because uh, every major decision had to go through the lens of two political dispensations. So it tested decisions, um, and that was, and both of them coming at it from, you know, worrying about it from their own political perspective, meant that you were covering a sort of broader spectrum of political decision, of, of political opinion across the country as you promulgated. Uh, those decisions. So, and the civil service stuff it is absolutely fixable. It is, I mean, there's, this is not the same now to talk about reform of the civil service, but there are all sorts of issues there that could be sorted out. It's not an absolute, of course, but there should be greater depth of expertise around particular policy areas in the civil service. The, the market in the civil service now for moving jobs has got very, very distorted for all sorts of reasons, but that is fixable. But I think the key point, you're thinking about five million folk lining up um, to oppose HS2. If that is the outcome after the decision has been made, that has not been a good process. Uh, it is about the process of decision making, the debate around decision making. At that level, that's quite a big one, it's sort of semi national. Um, that you have that debate, it is uh, ideally, it encompasses, it's across the political spectrum. Um, you involve communities, you involve it in all sorts of different... And you meet, reach a decision. And some people are always going to object to that decision. 
but at least they can see that the process was an open, honest, transparent one. They had their chance to have a say. The reasons put forward were not the sort of half, the, the sort of half dishonest ones um, that were, were put out when HS2 was first put in place. But if you bring it back to another big, you know, huge topic for the country, house building. Mm. You know, the ambition to build 300,000 houses a year hasn't been achieved since we were building a lot of council houses in the 1970s. Every government, now they've dropped that target. They've dropped the imposition of central targets on local government. How do we get houses built in this country? You can only do that, seems to me, by having that debate actually at a local level about how, where you build new houses, how you build them, the sort of communities you build, the design, uh, the transport links, all the rest of it, so that the communities, again, are involved in that. And they can see the outcome. Again, they may not... Some people always oppose having houses built in the field next door to where they live. But if they can see that that has been a, a fair process that they've been engaged in, then you've got a greater chance, it seems to me, of getting houses built where people want to live. I say all of that having milled, moved up a drafty hill in Dumfriesshire where nobody in their right mind would build a new house. So I'm sort of a bit exempt from that debate, but uh, you get the point. You've future-proofed yourself, uh, Philip. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's a great example, because here, in terms of uh, partisan divides, there are very few parties in the UK, I think, uh, running on a platform of let's not build new houses. We've got plenty. Um, so there is real political consensus, and yet we can't get it done. Here's a piece of long-term decision-making that we can't seem to get done. Um, is part of that, then... Perhaps, Kath, a question to you on uh, the role of civil servants and the sort of connection to this hyper-politicised atmosphere. Can we, should we, be protecting civil servants a little bit from that in some way to allow them to do some of this uh, future planning <coughs> and long-term implementation? Is yeah, there a way? definitely. I mean, as, as Philip's pointed out, it already does exist. There are plenty of parts of the civil service that engage very little with ministers and are spending a lot of time thinking. There are parts of the civil service, some of whom are here today, who spend a lot of their time thinking about data and evidence and analysing policy and who do engage with, with ministers. Um, so it already exists in, in some of the, those parts. I think there's more that we can do. The Institute has argued for a statute for the civil service, partly to recognise the fact that there is a stewardship role. If you're going to have a permanent civil service that is there to provide some continuity of institutional memory and capability functions um, from one government to another, you are recognising the fact that you want a resource that is able to, to tr you know, to, to transition between one government mm. and another. So why not firm that up a bit more? Why not make sure that the, the objectives of those who are the most senior in, in the civil service recognise that they've got to, to focus on that and therefore create the political space for them with ministers that this is a recognised function mm. And, mm. and role that they play. And I think that gets to the right side of the, the democratic deficit that, that you're talking about earlier and doesn't move you too far towards managerialism. Something that, that, frankly, the UK obsesses over far more than a lot of other countries who are quite comfortable um, with technocrats being technocratic. Um, but that's a, that's a different discussion. Um, I think it is worth just segueing slightly to think about the next couple of years because it's going to be really interesting on this front. You know, there are multiple scenarios that could happen at the next election, but the two big ones, that you could end up with a majority government, one side or the other. If it's returned Conservatives, you might see, you know, who Rishi Sunak really is as, as Prime Minister. Um, if it's a Keir Starmer government, you might see a resolution to, to the, the issues that Philip's talked about in terms of, of where is Labour actually wanting to go. Um, but either way, I think you have seen as a reaction to the fall of Boris Johnson and the trust government a, a move towards wanting more managerial, competent governments. Mm -hmm. There are definitely signs of it in terms of the way in which Rishi Sunak has approached the job. There are definitely signs of it in terms of the polling that's, that's coming out at the moment. Um, so I hope that that continues. And if there is a majority government, then maybe we can look at five years. I still think they will be obsessing over the next election, whatever their numbers are. 
The other world is that we end up with more volatility, either minority government or small majorities. And if we've learned nothing in the last sort of six years or even beyond that, it should be that small majority is not much easier than minority government. And if that happens, then again, I would love to see governments learning the lessons of um, the May years and realising that actually, if you've not got a, a majority, you can't govern as if you've got a majority. And you've got to think about how to build consensus cross-party. Um, there is this, this you know, cross-party consensus on all sorts of issues, so the will is there. It is this tribalism, this adversarialism that, that drives a, a lot of it. And it is very understandable. But... <coughs> Again, we know from speaking to politicians, they work very well behind the scenes together. There's a lot in the usual channels. There's a lot of cross-party friendships. There's a lot that goes into private members' bills. There's all sorts of ways in which it happens. And again, the public kind of like that stuff. Mm. So, uh, you know, it sounds like I'm just banging the drum for a more consensual, nicer version of politics, but it's doable, it is possible, and, and I think at the moment the public after the last few years is probably crying out for it. Yeah, I would, I would think that's fair. Um, I'm going to move to audience questions in a minute, so just prepare yourselves out there, and I feel like the left side of the room didn't get as, as good a run as the right, so I'm going to start over here, so especially prepare yourselves over there. Um, a final question, Halima, for you, if I can, which is that the, the sort of silent player in long-term policy making are future generations themselves. Um, and are there ways... So if we're trying to be more participative, we're trying to be more inclusive in our policy making, can, how, how do we allow for them? So do we go for a, you know, an Office of Future Generations sort of a model? Do we, as some of my colleagues in the Institute have been researching, give children the vote um, up to a, uh, or down to a particular age because they are um, just as invested in the future as, as someone who's 99 now? Um, how do we translate the sort of the voice of future generations, I suppose, into current um, policy thinking? Um, so, uh, so I think there's sort of two, two sort of categories of things come to mind. One, one is sort of recognising that our current accountability mechanisms, you could, you could describe them as being biased towards the short term. I think that would be a fair critique of them. So anything that even slightly rebalances away from the short term, and then thinking about, you know, whether it's sort of treasury accounting rules or, you know, all kind of value for money sort of definitions, all kinds of ways in which we hold ourselves to account in a policy sense are biased in that way. So, yes, you can, you can, you can think about, um, you know, well, we have in Wales a kind of the, the, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and Commissioner model, um, you know, that you could, you could think of sort of designated sort of hard wiring in the system that, that names that in a way and tries to sort of make the... Um, make the system accountable to it. And I think all of that, all of that sort of frontier, as I think, is very fertile and very important. And I think, you know, I think we should apply some creativity to that. And actually, you know, we're seeing it in some respects with, you know, young people on climate taking the government to court. And, you know, how can we as a kind of policy community respond to that in a sort of positive um, and creative way? So I think that's one category. But I guess... The other sort of thing that I wanted to sort of to mention was that I think sometimes with long termism and we we sort of quickly think about sort of hard wiring and incentives and and institutions and um, and so forth and that that is important. I think at the same time I, I wouldn't want us to lose sight of the really important role played by networks of people who work on an issue over a period of time inside and outside of government and the roles of coalitions and civil society outside of government to both um, set the agenda on the long term and hold the government to account over the long term on issues that, that they care about. And those, those players, whether it's sort of social movements, civil society groups, have themselves a real kind of legitimacy and mandate over the long term to make these arguments. And, you know, obviously, it's a, it's a, we want a mixed economy here, but I think we, we shouldn't always look to sort of 
inside of government mechanisms alone. I think we should also look at the the way in which the state interplays with other with other actors. And there's an enormous amount, you know. So so one example of, of a sort of um, a sort of area that I've sort of been involved with is the idea of sort of health and health being people being more in control of their health, personalised health, people powered health, and that has that's an agenda that has grown up um, from disability activists, from researchers, from civil servants who almost, you know, in private describe themselves as being kind of having an almost an activist mentality when it comes to sort of representing the views of people with um, disabled people and people with long-term health conditions. So those kind of networks that are sometimes um, not so visible, I think, are nonetheless very powerful and quite interesting. And there are equivalent networks on climate and, and all kinds of things. So, yes, I think when we think about the ways in which we can factor the future in, I think we should look both inside and outside of government to do that. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, it seems like a good moment to... Uh, <laughs> I can see hands starting to come up. Good heavens! Um, what am I going to do with you all? Uh, well, let's... <laughs> let's um, start uh, at the back there. Tola, if we can, thank you. Hi, I'm Saita Lui from Cambridge. Um, so we talked a, a lot about the uh, domestic policies. My interest uh, is really about the international policies. Um, how do we balance the response to domestic uh, demand regarding all kinds of uh, um, domestic issues with international development aid policies? Because international development is um, long term uh, by nature. And all of the rich countries uh, promised to um, have 0.7% of their GNI for international development budget. But when we see, uh, when, whenever there's a domestic uh, change or a squeeze in budget, those part of the budget will be uh, under uh, the very first to be cut. So um, I wonder what's your view on this? Thank you. Thank you, and then immediately in front. Um, Sorry, just as a person who currently works in an arm's length body and actually sees how these government reshuffles actually affect the kind of work that we are able to do and our interaction with, with the departments, I just wondered what you would say civil servants or arm's length bodies can do to help facilitate that institutional memory <coughs> side of things for ministers, just because we've had several sessions where we as the CQC have had to go back to government to re-explain who we are, what we do, what we can't do, um, what we shouldn't, you shouldn't think of us doing, um, and things like that. So is there something that could come from us rather than waiting for them? Thank you. Um, and yes, in, in the middle here, Tola. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Hitan Shah, uh, British Academy and on the Bennett Advisory Board. Um, I, I was... I, I was wondering how far we think that we're in a kind of political stasis period, especially because politics is now dominated by the desires of old people who turn out and vote. Uh, and I mean, house building is a kind of classic example, but there are many others where, in a sense, the, the things that might drive the growth and prosperity of the future uh, are not being implemented because actually the voters don't want it. So it's, it's not actually a problem of incompetence in government and structures. We're in a kind of political dynamic. And if that's the case, how long might we stay in that uh, kind of period of stasis and how do we get out of it? What a great set of three questions to, uh, to get us started. Um, uh, I was certainly not interested in old people's priorities until I became one, Heta, and so I'm uh, <laughs> finding myself more and more interested in these things. Um, but uh, what, what order should we take these in? Let, uh, let me start, perhaps, Philip, if I start with you on um, civil servants' institutional memory, how do, we, how do we retain this? How do we pass it along? Yeah, I absolutely recognise the problem that you get all this change and the, you know the world out there is, is complete well, what's going on Where, but don't assume that inside the house they know what's going on either so let me just relate one little story from my time in the department of practice in the eu i we lost quite a lot of ministers over my um, uh, few months in that job and i remember standing out in front of an audience more than about 700 of them in or maybe about three or four hundred of my team uh, after david davis had gone and I was put on a soapbox to tell on the morning after, so to talk to these folk and reassure them about what was going to happen. I didn't have a clue what was going to happen. And I, saw, and I, I was looking at all these expectant faces, gripped by a bit of panic. 
And then I remembered my, um, just to try and break the ice, my uh, older boy, he's a bit laconic, had uh, texted him that, me that morning, simply saying, having a good day, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I just read out that text of one or two others, and that sort of broke the ice. But the truth is that in those circumstances, the civil servants might be as much at sea as those outside are. But one of the jobs of good civil servants is to engage in those conversations in an honest way. And take a few risks, actually. And it's just going to room with, with those stakeholders, to use that uh, term I don't like, but uh, it's a term of art, and say, we are in a difficult situation. We don't know what's going to happen, but this is how you can make your views known and, and tell us what your worries are. Uh, and you take some risks in that. I mean, I did a lot of that talking to businesses, um, in particular through the Brexit time and other interest groups, um, can, you know, essentially admitting that there was a great lacuna in our thinking in government about the impacts of Brexit. And I was never caught out by that. Nobody ever, that never left the room. So the trust that I put in them was always rewarded with, a, 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 with actually their, me getting good feedback from them and that conversation being a better conversation than if I'd clammed up. But it is, it is something, and, and Kath will, will uh, maybe corroborate this in the name of two, but where civil servants are operating well, they have that openness and go a little bit beyond um, what the normal boundaries might look like to, to, to engage people in that uncertainty. Kath, anything to add on that um, one? Yeah, I mean, a couple of points. Another anecdote, just of the frustration of, of this stuff. Um, about every two years, somebody from the Cabinet Office is newly appointed to uh, look into the problem of institutional memory for the civil service and, get, <laughs> and, and they get back in touch with me and I keep having the same conversation with them. It's been going on for about 10 years now. One of them worked for you at one point. Um, so I'm looking forward to the next one. I will eventually just do a briefing document that I will give to them. But that goes to a, a point about this, which is... Actually, a lot of the times when we talk to ministers about taking on the job, it's incredibly daunting and quite scary. And a lot of the time, the civil service just kind of throws stuff at them and expect them to just learn it. So understand that, yes, OK, you've, you've kind of got to explain your starting position, who you are, etc. again. But that can also be an opportunity to help them learn and help them feel like you're incredibly useful to them. So see it as an opportunity to build a new relationship, to help them learn and pivot from just the kind of who we are, what we're doing, into, and this is why it's going to be useful for you to keep a, you know, a relationship with us. I mean, it's, it's what we talk about with, with academics when we're um, talking to them about how to engage with government and warning them that whichever relationships they build up with civil servants that they think is amazing, those civil servants are going to move on. So you've got to be prepared to sort of do the elevator pitch again and again. It's, it's, it's slightly part of the, the job for it, unfortunately. So institutional memory is alive and well. It's Kath Head. <laughs> um, uh, Halima, you wanted to come in? Um, I just thought, because, because this theme had been, has been with us the whole day, this, this issue of flip-flopping, of constant reversals of policy, of kind of chasing our tails, setting something up and then abolishing it five minutes later, I guess, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, it does feel like a sort of peculiarly uh, specific problem to this country, in a sense. I just wonder, is, is that the case? And then we've heard about sort of industrial policy in other countries sort of managing that much better over the longer term. We've, you know, examples from Germany and East Asia and Scandinavia, other countries that are subject to the same social media, the same 24 news hour news cycle, albeit no, perhaps, you know, different electoral systems. And, you know, that we do sort of come back to that. But, you know, do we just need to sort of own this problem that actually we've got a problem here actually and it's it's largely a Westminster Whitehall problem I think it, 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 and um, and I think you know possibly you know thinking of it in those terms might might sort of renew our sort of commitment to try wherever possible to try and kind of hold hold forth against that and he said that's partly about you know under very difficult circumstances, often sort of very good quality advice from civil servants and the nature of that advice and the extent to which that advice can draw on longer term thinking. And that obviously relates back to sort of capacity and obviously the, you know, our public sector capacity is 
um, you know, has been under stress for a, a number of years. But I just, yeah, it was a sort of a, a sort of a end of the afternoon thought that it does feel like it really is a problem, and that and that um, maybe we should do something about it. Yeah, just pivoting on that to the the other question about aid. One of the department that does best uh, when it comes to institutional memory is the Foreign Office, and part of that is they've got an actual set of historians who work there, but they've also got the research analysts who are the main experts on it, and they've also got embassies. And when it comes to international policy, actually one of the things that is very important for the UK is that relationship between the embassies and the role they play abroad and how that connects back to um, UK policy. And, and another long-standing problem that we've had is that that tends to be a very Paul Mill kind of perspective and has been on aid. There has been since um, the early 2000s a bit more of a focus on the MOD, the Foreign Office, and the then separate aid department getting together in country better. Um, where it's less good is on uh, international economic policy. And there is a question there about whether or not we want to be better joining up because the Treasury tends to try and keep hold of that particular area of policy. So. I think there's probably more that we could do there, but I don't think it's um, an entirely sort of um, sad story to tell when it comes to that. <laughs> Just a little bit of positivity and try. <laughs> the I'm overwhelming not optimism. My mum may be watching, so I'm not going to tackle the question about the older generation either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, perhaps I can tie that in, that excellent question from you, Hetan, in, into one from uh, that's come from online, which is about... Um, your perspective, Halima, on sort of co-creating solutions with the community and whether there's sort of a, a too optimistic a sense that citizens and communities will take a longer-term view when um, politicians won't. And I think that ties into the, um, the question about uh, stasis, uh, comfort, if you like, of people of a certain age with um, things as they are. Are citizens part of the problem? Halima. Um, I would say no. <laughs> Just come up with it. Um, so, you know, I think, well, so there are, we're in a city um, full of uh, neuroscientists, so I, I won't... But, uh, there's an element to which humans are just not very good at long-termism. I mean, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, you know, with, but, you know, so we, we have to work hard at this stuff, don't mm. we? So I think we should sort of be forgiving on ourselves to some extent on that. Um, but we then, we do, we, you know, we do now have tools at our disposal that we know help with this stuff. So back to the sort of participatory co-design sort of space, you know, there are tools of deliberation which have been, you know, used and developed um, over, you know, over periods of decades where, you know, citizens are supported to take on board, you know, all kinds of different sort of forms of knowledge and to sort of reflect and deliberate and come up and, you know, my impression of that practice and, and that evidence is actually it's it's really surprising just how far you can get. Actually, people are very receptive, um, but it, you, know, you, you, know, you do need to provide the right environment and the right kind of support for those things. Um, but I, I would say, um, you know, thinking of citizens as the problem is, is, isn't the right way of thinking about it in the same way that when we were in the, the strategy unit, you know, sometimes that, you know, felt like sort of other parts of Whitehall were the problem. Again, that's, that's not the right way of thinking about it. It's, it's what, under what circumstances can the right conversations be convened in order to create the kinds of sort of, to, to lift all of our sights above the here and now into the longer term. Mm. Thank you. Let's have some more questions in the room. Um, I see. Uh, right, right at the very back. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Chris Gentle's name. Um, given it's late on a Friday, I thought it would be more creative with this because one of the things we've seen is basically we seem to be going around the cycle again and again and not making progress. Uh, I'm from the world of business, and, and one of the things we've seen is basically we've shifted from five-year plans, which were with, with Henry Mintzberg and stuff like that, if you're aware of it, to a, what's called the VUCA world now. You probably were a VUCA. What, what successful businesses have done around this is basically they've done two things. One is they've decentralized, so they push things right down to the bottom of the business. And the second thing they've done is to make them successful is that they're good at gathering the information that comes right from the uh, edges of their, their businesses in order to have uh, long-term stewardship. I think it was uh, Catherine who mentioned about that stewardship. 
So I just wondered what the panel might think about that innovation, because we don't seem to be seeing it in policy. I think Salima also said about being creative, but <clears throat> business have gone to, to switch their model in order to get both long-term stewardship and be kind of short-term creative. And if I go into a business as a business consultant, I can tell if a business is going to be successful because it allows that information flow. If the information flow is not there, it's not going to have the long-term stewardship. So I just wondered what the panel thought about bringing that kind of innovation to, uh, to the ways that we, we kind of uh, operate as, uh, in terms of public policy. Thank you. Um, Theresa? Theresa? Um, down towards, yes, thank you. Thank you. It's John. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it will be an excellent question either She's way, cool. please. Um, no, it's just I, I wanted to break into this um, bout of self-flagellation <laughs> on the public. I mean, there, there's an assumption, and it follows on from what the previous speaker said. Um, there's an assumption that uh, the private sector does this better. And if you believe that, then you should see what's happening uh, in the tech companies because of uh, chat GPT. Uh, it, it, all, I, it reminds me of a conversation I was part of once with Astra Teller, who heads the Google X Lab. That's a lab which takes on projects which only have a one in 100 chance of success. And somebody asked him, why on earth is a public company doing this? And his answer was, A, because no government will do long-term stuff anymore, uh, and B, Actually, no major public, uh, public operation will do long-term stuff because it's entirely focused on quarterly analyst phone call conversations. And his view was that in that case, it's up to us. We have plenty of talent and we have money coming out of our ears. But the point is that, that, the, the, point is that the problem of flip-flopping is not confined to the public sector. I'm not sure if we should be reassured by that or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sean, in the middle here. Uh, sorry, Jim, my across there, yes, please. Uh, thanks very much, Dennis. Um, I'm Sean Morgan. Uh, I was the permanent secretary for the Welsh Government until about 18 months ago. When I arrived in that role, I was so impressed to uh, discover what I think is an extraordinary piece of legislation in place, which is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, uh, which is designed to do what it says on the tin and provide a framework for uh, politicians and policymakers to think about the long term, to think about the next generation when they are developing policies. You can see that as the framework that is uh, driving uh, policy on um, the environment, biodiversity, climate change, for example. Uh, I think it's incredibly enlightened, really impressive, not straightforward, uh, but, you know, heading in the right direction. Since I left uh, the Welsh Government, I've been chairing uh, an NHS trust in the southwest of England. Uh, so I'm obviously still interested in the well-being of future generations, but in a different perspective. And I think something that most people would probably agree with is we do need to look uh, at the future of health and social care in the UK. Uh, I would like the panel's thoughts on how to go about building that consensus so it's not a short-term uh, policy uh, because if anything needs a long-term vision, it's the future of the NHS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have three questions here. Uh, one suggesting uh, business is doing things right, um, five-year plans um, and the capacity to grab information from the, the edges of an organisation and mm. bring it in. Um, the perspective that uh, actually flip-flopping um, happens everywhere and there is a perception that long-term equals risky and how do we balance that out? Uh, and uh, the, the not easy question of how we build consensus on health and social care, as an example maybe, of how you build um, long-term uh, policy making. So uh, who, who shall I start with? Yes, Cathy, please. Thank you. I'm going to go first because then I can dodge the difficult question. Excellent plan. <laughs> um, on that point about long-term stewardship, it is a very good point. Uh, we wrote a report years ago, uh, rather my colleagues did, on system stewardship, envisaging this, this idea that government would increasingly move towards much more of a stewardship role and you'd see much more policy-making uh, 
um, elsewhere. I think in defense of government, actually a hell of a lot of what it does is that, and we always focus on the, re you know, the, the very noticeable big policy failures or the stuff that is in the grid and therefore makes the headlines, is briefed out, etc. But if you look at the workload of the average minister, a hell of a lot of it is stewardship effectively. It is, you know, looking through the, the risks that are coming up. It is slight adjustments to legislation or putting out a consultation that's necessary in the journey that a particular sector is going through. Um, and the, the, it all includes a hell of a lot of, of policy successes as well, but we tend not to focus on, on a lot of those. Um, there are obviously huge amounts of the civil service who are doing this stuff day in, day out, and who aren't um, are dealing with the sort of the big ticket stuff that we've been talking about today. So I think it's worth remembering that. On the other hand, just in defense of the sort of big ticket policy moments, it's worth remembering that um, net zero actually came during what you might argue was Theresa May's caretaker government period, a period that when it came to Boris Johnson's time in, in that role when they were looking for a new leader, we argued that um, you shouldn't announce big new policy areas because with Boris Johnson that was a bit of a concern. <laughs> Um, but for Theresa May, you know, out of the, the shadow of Brexit and suddenly thinking about her legacy, that was the moment that she, she chose to commit the UK to that front. And it's now taken as a, a consensus across all parties and, you know, across the whole of government. So there is those extraordinary moments for that sort of the, the big picture um, uh, piece of policy that does come out of our political system. So I think it's worth remembering that as well. I have dodged the NHS. <laughs> <laughs> Seems very sensible to me, um, which means I'm going to have to ask somebody else to address it. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the Prime Minister. I mean, that was a good decision. Um, I've rung up... It's not a long-term decision. <laughs> <laughs> I've rung up a very trusty former Permanent Secretary and I've said put in place, Philip, a long-term plan for fixing health care and social care in this country. How, do, how would you start? So, actually, I'm going to try and wrap a number of those Please. questions here, if I may, because I think the answer to that question, in many respects, does not lie with the Prime Minister or with Whitehall and Westminster. It lies a lot more locally. And if you, it, it, it picks up the point about older folk as well, because if you, and what Hema has been saying about local engagement... And most older folk have got children, have got grandchildren. They are concerned about the services provided to the youngsters, the ability of those people to get houses, decent education, decent health care, um, and, and the rest of it. And this thing about long-term policy being risky, government has to do, when you're educating youngsters, you are doing long-term policy making, whether you like it or not. And, and so you're in that business. The key question is, how are those... Uh, those decisions made, how are they marshalled, how do you build the capability and I think this goes to the heart of the social care health thing as well I'll come back, there is a big overarching issue we'll come on to in a minute, but if you want effective health care and social care that has to function at a local level where the different teams, empowered professionals delivering those services to those individuals can do so in a way which best suits the needs of those individuals uh, and and will 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 work in a cohesive way. We all know because we've all had personal experience of how the, the the dysfunction of those services is as much about the fact that they don't talk to each other, that you have to go through the system several times to give the same information, and all the rest of it. So, and and the the, the thing about the business example about that capacity to understand your market. If you're in Whitehall and you're trying to run schools across England, this is crazy. You cannot understand the needs of schooling in Tyne and Weir or in Liverpool in a way that the folk in Liverpool and Tyne and Weir can do that. So all of that is a big peon for take the decisions at the right level because that's where you can get the engagement. And ultimately, that's where you can get the citizen engagement that says, OK, where do you want to spend your money? Do you prioritise potholes over a decent primary school for your kids? Yeah. I don't, and it, this happens in some polities. You can do this. You cannot do that uh, from the Whitehall level. But there is just one overarching rider on that. And that is the quantum of resource that the state garners in order to support those services. So I would argue for a, a sluggard fiscal devolution so that more of those decisions, again, can be taken locally about how you spend 
your hard-earned money in support of those services. But one of the things that I think, one of the things that's bedeviled policy making in this country uh, at the macro level is that choice about the tax take. And we're obsessing now about the increase of the tax take. It's the highest it's been for decades and most of it. It's actually not that high compared to an awful lot of European countries. And the big debate we need to have at the national level is what is the balance between the money we pay into uh, the state and the quality of public services? At the moment, the politicians pretend, of every party pretty much, that you can have world-class public services uh, on uh, a tax take that is lower um, uh, than, uh, than, it, than is necessary to provide those services. So that is a public debate which I think the politicians at the national level uh, are ducking and have a responsibility to address. Mm. But they, the key, I think, just to end on this note, the key to good decision-making that involves people in decisions that affect their lives, it has to be about those decisions taken at the right level. And that, I think, is one of the big missing pieces mm -hmm. uh, in the way this country is governed. Um, thank you. Uh, the, the sad fact <laughs> is that we've arrived at 5 o'clock. Um, I know there are lots of questions still in the room. I know there's lots of things still to say on the panel. The only reassurance I can provide you uh, with is that the Bennett Institute is here for the long term. <laughs> <laughs> so we will get to your questions. Um, now, we're just going to have a short comfort break before the keynote. So um, I'll ask you to be back by um, a quarter past. No doubt there'll be a gong sounding out there. Just before you have that comfort break, can I ask you to join me, please, in thanking this outstanding panel?